Hi everyone and welcome to Learn Neuroradiology. My name is Brent Weinberg, the creator of LearnNeuroradiology.com. Today I've got an exciting lecture for you where we're going to talk about the emergent imaging of brain tumors. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how you might have a general approach to brain tumors, tell you some of the common tumors that you might encounter, particularly in the setting of CT. I'm going to help you figure out how to formulate a differential diagnosis when you're looking at these masses, and I want you to be able to describe some of the common complications of brain tumors and red flags that you might see on imaging so that you can be an expert in interpreting brain tumors. So without further ado, let's dive in and take a look at some of the imaging. So let's talk a little bit about the role of imaging in brain tumor emergencies. When you're imaging brain tumors, you have to think about two main tools you might use, CT and MRI. Now CT is a screening tool. And that's really going to be to use uh, to find complications of the brain tumor. So things like hemorrhage, edema, mass effect, hydrocephalus or enlargement of the ventricles, and herniation. So things that are really complications. It's often going to be a screening tool as well when people present with their initial symptoms. However, MRI is the mainstay of tumor imaging. When you do MRI, there's a couple of things that are really mandatory sequences, namely diffusion, flare, and pre and post contrast to T1. Now you're gonna have some other sequences that you'll sometimes perform. Many times they're for troubleshooting. These are namely MRI perfusion, spectroscopy, and diffusion tensor imaging or functional imaging. These are often tools that are used to troubleshoot problems or to plan for surgery. Now CT, like I said, it's for initial identification of a mass, evaluation for hemorrhage, herniation or mass effect, and hydrocephalus. So here you see a patient, they have a glioblastoma. This is before they started their treatment. You have a CT, you don't really see a whole lot going on. You've got pretty symmetric ventricles, maybe a little mass effect on the occipital horn of this right lateral ventricle. Then the patient came in, they're in the middle of radiation therapy, they have new left-sided weakness and headache, and if you look, there's a lot more edema in that right cerebral hemisphere, maybe some areas of hemorrhage. So these are some complications, you see the mass effect is worsening there. So those are the kind of things that you're going to see on CT. So this is a successful use of CT in a patient who had a known brain tumor. Most of the time in a CT, you're not looking for changes in the tumor burden, right? So you can comment in the report, like, you know, this is not designed to evaluate for the overall tumor burden, but neuro-oncologists and people following up brain tumors, they know that. They're often doing a CT, like I said, to look for those complications. So when you do an MRI in a brain tumor patient, it's often to help you make the initial diagnosis. Uh, for pretreatment planning, so to decide on what kind of surgery and radiation therapy you're going to be performing. After surgery, people frequently get MRIs within 24 to 48 hours. That's to evaluate the extent of resection, so you can see how much tumor has been resected. A key point there is that after about 48 hours, a lot of the post-surgical changes will start to enhance, and it's more challenging to see the extent of resection. Then, after the initial treatment, these patients are going to get longitudinal follow-up anywhere from about every 1 to 12 months. A lot of times that will be closer at the beginning, uh, but when the condition stabilizes, particularly for lower-grade tumors, that can be spaced out to about every uh, 12 months or so. Now, key sequences that are going to have every time include these below here, flare, diffusion, and pre- and post-contrast. So let's talk a little bit about the different sequences you might obtain. So flare is really a key sequence. Uh, here you see a flare image on the, uh, on the right of the screen. And what it shows you is a mix of edema and infiltrative tumor. And uh, a lot of times you can also see post-treatment effects, so gliosis, for instance, from radiation therapy. So here you have a tumor. The enhancing part would be right here, but you've got this mix of hyperintense flare around it. That's a combination of vasogenic edema and uh, infiltrative tumor. And it's really, you can't tell the difference in those things, but flare is really a workhorse because it's going to tell you the extent of the abnormality, how much brain is involved, and how much overall swelling that there is. Flare is really the most useful sequence if you're going to compare it directly to a CT. It's kind of the inverse of a CT because water is going to be brighter on flare. Brain that has more water content is going to be darker on CT, so it's going to be an inverse. And so you just kind of can invert them in your mind, and they should appear more or less similar. The second key sequence in MRI is the post-contrast T1. That's going to show you areas of blood-brain barrier breakdown. That can be areas of tumor where the blood-brain barrier no longer exists. That can be also from radiation effects where radiation therapy has caused injury to the blood-brain barrier. 
So here you see that same study that we saw before. This is a pre-contrast. Uh, here you see kind of a rounded lesion in the right posterior frontal lobe here. And you see that edema surrounding it is dark on T1. When you give contrast, the areas of uh, most infiltrative tumor, the most aggressive tumor, have areas of blood-brain barrier breakdown. That's where you see the contrast leaking out into the tissue there. That's the enhancing portion of the mass. Uh, so that's the concerning area of the mass there. Now, what is the role in emergent imaging? Like when should you do uh, each set of imaging? If patients do not have a known tumor, imaging is used to possibly identify a potential tumor, to give a potential uh, practical di a differential diagnosis, and to think about what the next steps are. In patients with a known tumor, you think about performing imaging to assess for urgent complications. We kind of talked about what those are, hemorrhage, mass effect, hydrocephalus, and assess the severity and what next steps might need to be taken. A lot of times if you do CT initially, it might be that you need to do an MRI afterwards. What is not the role of emergent imaging? So it's not to give an exact diagnosis. Many of these patients are, you're not going to be able to give a diagnosis until they're biopsied. Most of the time for emergent imaging, you're not trying to assess for tumor progressions. You're not trying to see like how much worse is it? Is it more enhancing? Blah, blah, blah. You're really just trying to assess for the emergent potential complications. So in summary, when you're doing imaging of brain tumors in an emergent situation, CT is for your screening at emergent presentation, you're looking for complications, whereas MRI is to refine your differential and uh, really move forward with pre-surgical and radiation planning. MRI is also the mainstay of longitudinal follow-up. So that really summarizes the role of imaging. In the next couple of lectures, what we're going to cover is some of the different types of tumors and a little bit more detail about what you can say and how to refine your differential diagnosis. So be sure to tune back in for those videos and check them out. Thanks for tuning in today, and uh, be sure to check us out at LearnerRadiology.com.